Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Do things like spoon bending and energy healing actually happen? Can they be proven according to the standards of science? Can anyone do these things? Hello there and welcome to the 393rd edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Ben, and those pretty good questions, not just pretty good, they were very good questions <laughs> that came from my co-host and partner in the paranormal, my dad. But before we welcome our guest, let's do our weekly paranormal contest. So the question from last week was, what house, uh, what famous house, rather, in Newport, Rhode Island, was haunted, or had a haunted but yeah, had a haunted suit of armor. Sorry. Still does. <laughs> yeah, still does. Well, the first to get that one right was Matt Harris from Boston, and the answer was Belcourt Castle. And if you ever see the Travel Channel's Curses of New England, I'm actually in there talking about Belcourt Castle and how things can be haunted. Let me just say one thing. Uh, I hope everyone is doing all right in the storm here. Our, our guest was concerned about us all day, and was we were emailing back and forth to reassure her we were okay. We were going to be on the air tonight, power permitting, which so far so good. Yeah, not but there have been there are about seventy thousand people in Rhode Island. Uh, who are out of power right now, uh, and uh, nearby Massachusetts and Connecticut, I'm, I'm not sure. But if you do need uh, some information, we will try to help you even during the show. Ben uh, does work here at the station and has access to information. So the number is the same if you want to call in for with a question for us or our guest, uh, 401-766-1240 locally or nationally, 800-449-1240. That's nationally or from Canada. So we'll proceed. And uh, hope for the best here. We do seem to have escaped the worst of it in our immediate area of northern Rhode Island. There have been a lot of people who have had their power knocked out. But things are, are being restored, and it, the, the, the worst of the storm is north of us, west of us, and south of us. But somehow it doesn't seem, us in the Cape seem to have escaped uh, the worst of it anyway. So anyway, uh, again, Ben, go right ahead. We'll continue with our normal script here. Indeed. So this week's question is, what is considered the most haunted restaurant in Las Vegas? So get that right and win a copy of Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny, my dad's most recent book. So we do welcome callers this evening. The numbers are locally, as we previously mentioned, 401-766-1240, or from anywhere in the U.S., 401 401- Four four nine one two four zero. So again, locally four zero one seven six six one two four zero, or anywhere from the U.S. four zero one four four nine one two four zero. A graduate of the University of Connecticut, Maureen Caudle earned her master's in physics from Cornell University. She spent more than twenty years as a computer scientist, fifteen of those as a researcher in artificial intelligence and neural networks. As a program manager and artificial intelligence researcher, she worked on such projects as DARPA, that's the High Performance Knowledge Based Program, and ARDA, Advanced Question Answering for Intelligence. That's also one of the ancient gods from Tolkien, I think. All right, anyway, uh, Maureen has a number, has written a number of books, including Ponderous Tomes on Artificial Intelligence, Robotics, and Neural Networks for MIT Press and Oxford University Press. When she encountered a number of paranormal events in her life, she had to reevaluate her position on a number of things and started finding overwhelming evidence for the reality of the paranormal. The resulting book is Impossible Realities, The Science Behind Energy Healing, Telepathy, Reincarnation, Precognition, and Other Black Swan Phenomena. Maureen's website, www.maureencaudill.com, M-A-U-R-E-E-N-C-A-U-D-I-L-L.com. There are links to it on BehindTheParanormal.com. So Maureen Caudill, welcome to Behind the Paranormal. Thank you. Well, thank you, too, for your concern for us today. We are uh, standing upright and taking a breath every now and then. We are indeed alive. All right. Yeah, I I actually think uh, we're getting, I'm in North Carolina, and I think that we're getting it almost as bad down here as you guys up there. Oh, oh my goodness, I know, but I wouldn't want to be in Jersey or New York right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Uh, Isn't that the truth? I'll certainly pray for those folks. All right, so before we go uh, anywhere else, uh, what are the black swan phenomena? Okay, that that actually is a little parable, which comes from the if you have a theory that all swans are white, in order to disprove that theory, you only have to find one verified black swan. So today in science, there is a theory, an, an assumption really, rather than a theory, that 
paranormal phenomena don't exist. They're all hoaxes or mistakes or whatever. Um, and so to disprove that theory, all we have to do is find even one paranormal example that is verified by science, and then you can no longer say that they don't exist. Well, the book Impossible Realities is my sort of riff on that, and I find not one black swan. I found a whole, as I like to call it, a bevy, a herd of black swans. And I talked about eight specific ones, um, reincarnation and energy healing and telepathy and so on and so on. Um, But each of those, what I was looking at was what is the scientific, peer-reviewed, published in scientific journal type evidence that these things exist, and I found masses of it. There's just masses of it. You, you, you know, so please don't believe anybody who tells you there's no evidence, no scientific credible evidence for the paranormal because there's a boatload of it. Hmm. All right, so what paranormal events... Uh, oh. I'm sorry, huh, my mic wasn't on. So what paranormal events happened to you to get you into this line of research? Okay, um, that's very interesting. I I took, gosh, 10 or 12 years ago, I took a week-long retreat um, at a place called the Monroe Institute in in Faber, Virginia. It's in the, up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, about half an hour south of Charlottesville and UVA. Um, And I didn't really honestly quite know why I signed up for this week-long retreat, or I, I was really burned out at my career and needed, hadn't taken a vacation for a really long time. And I got up there, and um, these programs, this was called the Gateway Voyage Program, and the programs are, um, start on Saturday afternoon, evening, and they run until the following Friday morning. They're like a week. Um, and the first thing that happens when you get there while you're settling into your little, into the space, is um, one of the two facilitators or trainers pulls you aside just to chat and and get to know you a little bit. And almost the first thing this facilitator said to me was, okay, Maureen, now don't be surprised if you don't go out of body during the program this week because there's only a certain percentage of people who do that actually during the program. And I thought, what? (laughs) Go out of body? What 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 did I sign up for? I didn't quite know. And then, of course, we had dinner, and then after dinner, there was everybody gathered. There were two dozen of us. There were 24 people in this program. And uh, they had us go around the room and introduce ourselves. And as I went around the room and I listened to everybody talking about who they were and what their backgrounds were, I realized in that room there were 23 people who were... um, they were mystics, they were meditators, they were new age, they were into yoga, they were into all kinds of very strange things, and there was one techie nerd. And guess who the techie nerd was? Me. Can't imagine. Yeah. yeah. And that's when I realized I had really fallen down a rabbit hole, and I started wondering if I could get my money back or if I could, you know, go hang out um, in a little nice motel in Charlottesville for a week. The odd thing was, that was Saturday evening, by Monday evening, I had had so many peculiar things happen to me that were so incredibly psychic that I could no longer count myself among those who could not believe in psychic events because they were happening to me. And I was a person that had never had a single psychic event happen to her in my whole life. So that was a complete mind-boggling change for, for me because I just, I, I couldn't believe it was happening. It was it was shocking. It was incredible. Well, it sounds like it. So early in your book, you talk about um, how you actually teach people to spoon bend, and how does that work? Um, I don't do the workshops very often these days, but I I do. Um, I have done tons of work, of workshops with people, uh, ranging from you know like a day long thing to one that lasts for several days. And one of the things I try to teach people is that there is a, an, a subtle energy, sometimes called a chi energy, that you can learn to access and manipulate. The problem is that just like I did when I first learned about this stuff, people tend to believe that it's imaginary, that they're just, you know, oh, it's, I'm just making believe and it's, I'm, not, I'm just sort of going through motions and there's nothing really happening. 
the problem is, how do you convince people that what they're manipulating is real energy? So I came up with the idea of teaching people how to use that energy to cause stainless steel forks and spoons to become soft so they could bend them. So I included that as part of my sort of standard workshop repertoire, and it was hugely successful. Um, the thing is that when I do spoon bending, I don't stand up there and bend a bunch of spoons because there are too many stage magician tricks that can make that seem like it's a fake. And people, will, they're not sure whether to believe what I'm doing is real or not. So what I do is I hand out forks to everybody. I like forks instead of spoons. I hand out forks to everybody. And I make sure they're good quality forks. They're not the little cheapy things. You know, these are forks that are very sturdy forks. And then I talk them through the process and have them bend their own fork. And the point of the exercise, in addition to being an enormous amount of fun and everybody is kind of raucous and I have people yelling at their cutlery and all kinds of things, <laughs> and it, 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 they just have great fun with it. But the real point of it is that this energy that they thought was just imaginary is the energy they're using to cause the stainless steel forks to soften and bend. And the other thing is that 40 years ago, the CIA had done uh, metallurgical tests on psychically bent forks and spoons. And they discovered that the crystalline structure of a psychically bent fork is different from the crystalline structure of a fork that is bent like with pliers and a vice, for example, or mechanically bent, or even one where somebody's taken a welding torch to it to bend it. It has a unique crystalline structure that's quite different from something that's been mechanically messed with. So you can tell, if you've got enough money to run metallurgical tests, you can actually distinguish which forks are psychically bent and which forks were mechanically bent. So wow. this is, it, and that's been done for 40 years, and yet you yeah. will still find people claiming that spoon bending is a hoax. Mm -hmm. Some hoax. I get virtually a 100% success rate. Everybody can do it. It's easy to learn, not hard, and it's real. So how do you do it? Is it sort of like the matrix, like instead of bending the fork, you bend your mind sort of thing? No, I, you know, I, I, before I teach them spoon bending, I've taught them some basic energy exercises mm -hmm. of how to access and manipulate the chi energy. And then I just basically have them apply that energy work to the fork. I have them hold it between their two hands and run energy back and forth the length of the fork. And that's enough and have the intention in their minds that what they want this energy to do is make the fork become softened and melt. And it, 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 I'm teaching sort of kindergarten level spoon bending. It doesn't usually, usually, most people, it doesn't droop on its own. But what happens is it's like modeling clay. It becomes very, uh, it becomes sort of first a little bit stiff. But, but bendable, and then suddenly you find the more you work with it, the softer it is, and so it's just like bending butter. I mean, a, a, a three-year-old could bend it. It becomes so soft. And then if you place the fork down, like on a table or something, and don't touch it for four or five minutes, it sets into that new um, configuration, whatever you did. And, um, and if you want to bend it anymore, you have to start the process all over again. You have to bring it up, and you have to run energy through it and let it get soft, and then you can maneuver it again. Well, you know, all, almost all the spoons in our uh, silverware drawer in our kitchen are bad. I'm always blaming Ben for it. Yeah. You know, but, uh, okay, Maureen, I must say that Impossible Realities is one of the best books on the subject that I've ever read. And I've been a professional editor for 35 years, so I'm not easy to please. Uh, oh, well, thank you. I and that, that's why it. you're here tonight. Uh, but I have to tell you this, and this is not a criticism. It's just something weird that happened while I was reading your book. Um, when I And I don't want to spend too much time on this spoon, Benny, but I just thought this would be interesting for people to hear. Uh, when I read that part of the book about that, I decided to try it. Now, you don't specifically give instructions, and, and you know, you just talk you know, much as you just described is what you say in the book. But I thought there was enough information to take it out on the dance floor and see what happened. So after concentrating for 15 or 20 minutes on this poor fork, uh, absolutely nothing happened. 
So I recall that you wrote uh, that a, a small percentage of people who just, th there are a small percentage who just can't do it. right? So I figured, well, that's a story of my life. I'm probably one of them. So I turned back to the computer to resume, resume my own writing and went, went to print something. The printer made all kinds of strange noises and uh, banging sounds as the cartridges moved. And I took the thing apart and lodged in the print mechanism was a large sa metal safety pin. Even if I had safety pins in my home office and library, which I don't, there's no way one could have found its way into the innards of this right. printer. Uh, so now, over uh, many de decades of paranormal research, I've often run into unintended consequences yes. of psychic experiments. So in concentrating on the stupid four, could I have unintentionally apported the middle, that metal pin into my printer? And, you Ab know, absolutely. Um, I, I think in the book I also talk about one um, experiment I did. I would, I, somebody had once told me that it was possible to sprout seeds in the palm of your hand. I've never seen it done. I have no idea how they do it. Right, yeah, you talk about that, yeah. I've heard that, that people can do that. Mm -hmm. So I decided so have I. I was, well, I decided I was going to set up a workshop and I was going to include seed sprouting. But first I had to learn how to do it myself. So I said, okay, so one day I got some seeds from my local nursery and I think I soaked them in water for an hour instead of overnight like you would normally do. And the seeds, I can't even remember what kind they were, but they said they would sprout in 7 to 14 days. So after soaking it for an hour, I put a few, I, I took some, I sat down in my favorite meditation chair, propped my right hand up, like on a pillow, palm up, so that it was very stable, it wouldn't move, and I put a few seeds in the palm of my hand, and then I sort of cupped my left hand over that, like a, you know, not quite clasping hands, but just cupping it over it so that there w it was covered, I couldn't see it. And I started doing my energy thing. I started, you know, I gathered some energy, some chi energy. I started running it back and forth between the palms of my hand through the seeds, which are in the right palm. And I did this for three or four minutes, and all of a sudden I saw a flash of light come out from between my palms. And I felt like a mild electric shock, just like a little zap kind of thing. And I said, wow, maybe I did this first time out, you know? <laughs> So I took my left hand away, and I looked in the palm of my right hand, and the seeds had not sprouted. What had happened was they disappeared. They disappeared? They disappeared. All you gardeners out there, pay heed. This was not the intended consequence. And, in fact, I find that some of the most impressive things that have happened to me have happened when I've been trying to do something else entirely. Well, you know, so I, I unintended think that, consequences, seeds disappear, they don't sprout. Well, that's interesting because in, in 42 years of paranormal work, which has not really concentrated in lab stuff such as, the, you know, controlled circumstances such as these, I have found that unintended consequences are rampant in life, never mind in paranormal research, because really all of life is, is paranormal in the sense that, that we talk about it. And y you have... Things that occur, people call them synchronicities and different things that are, oh gee, what a funny coincidence. I think we have a hand in causing. You know what's funny? I actually, I actually tried to do the spoon, like the spoon bending thing too when I, I was still kind of sick and I was trying to kill time and couldn't really figure out what to do and my kill dad. time. It must be nice. You know what? I was sick. Leave I me know, alone. I know. <laughs> Sorry. So you told me about how you tried to spin, spoon bend. I took a fork and I was just, I just really like, I just like sat there and got into a meditative state and I just was like, ah, oh, this is, I stopped and I was like, after like 10 minutes, I was like, ah, oh, this is crap. And I looked and like the spoon bent to the right and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> when was that? You know, we live in the same house and we don't, I don't know half this stuff. Oh, well, just because I kind of forgot about it until now. Oh, yeah, I, it happens I just, every I day. Just, no, I just sort of dismissed it because oh, it, like, okay. didn't bend that much. But, like, I looked and I was like, oh, it, bend, it bent a little bit. Yeah, like, you... it, like, enough to be noticeable. Pretty cool. Well, yeah. pr proceed, my son. Oh, right. So um, you also talk about remote viewing, so, like, mm -hmm. the Project Stargate kind of stuff. So what evidence have you found for that? Um, uh, there's, there's a, Actually, that's probably one of the best. Uh, researched areas of psychic phenomena. There's there's a, a ton of good research on that. Um, I recommend Paul Smith's book, whose title just completely escapes me. He was one of the Stargate remote viewers, actually. Joe McMonagall also has several really excellent, excellent books on, on how the military and CIA remote viewing programs worked and a lot of the, the results that they've had. Do they still but, use them? 
Pardon me? Do they still use those groups? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. No. Well, yeah. I, okay, here's the deal. The CIA shut down the Stargate program, okay? Mm -hmm. However, I personally know a number of remote viewers who work for the military and the intelligence agencies. It just started up again under a different black project name, you know. Um, and I and I suspect that there were some political consequences with the head of the CIA who disapproved of of remote viewing, um, and so therefore shut it down. That's a real problem when you're dealing with anything psychic. Uh, I mean, I have had people tell me that any time I'm working with anything psychic, that I'm doing the work of the devil. Oh yeah. Okay? Yeah, okay. I get that all the time. Yeah. The CIA head who shut down the Stargate program was sort of of that opinion. And so it had to go underground to well, a large extent. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it stopped because it's too useful to stop. Um, the remote viewing is, you know, there is just tons of evidence for remote viewing accuracy and remote viewing effectiveness. Um, the numbers are just incredible. Uh, it's very real. Um, I took a week-long program on remote viewing from one of the people who actually ran the Army remote viewing program, um, and that's uh, Skip Atwater. And um, his, his comment was that the research that they had done at that time indicated that there's really only one group of people who seem absolutely unable to remote view and that's people who have um, photographic memory. For oh. some reason, having that photographic memory seems to interfere with being able to learn how to remote view. Yeah, that now, matches up with some of the stuff I've found, yeah. Yeah, So, but nobody knows why. Nobody knows what it is about remote viewing versus photographic memories that are in conflict, but that appears to be the case. Well, the more, um, you, the more you think about it, the less you can do it. Yeah, that seems to be some sort of rule, I don't know. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things that our culture doesn't allow us to admit that they're there, and so therefore, you know, you it's, you have to get into a special state of mind. You have to learn how to access altered states of consciousness, mm -hmm. consciousness to be able to do these things, and um, that's very scary for people. Sure. Um, but you know, I think that everybody has every psychic talent to some degree or another. I agree, yeah. I, I take psychic talent as being a normal, natural human skill. It it's is a survival skill. It is culturally trained out of us most mm. of the time. Yeah, it is. You're right. Absolutely. But, but it's normal and it's natural. Now, that does not mean that everybody is going to be a John Edward type medium or Joe McMonagall remote viewer. What it does mean is everybody can do it to some degree, at, to some level of expertise, and with some degree of consistency. Um, but I, I liken it to learning how to play the piano. Okay, pretty much anybody can hum a tune or can peck out chopsticks on a piano. I mean, even I can do that. Mm. Okay, don't have to be any great musician to be able to hum a tune or or, or do that. If I want to be able to play music at a party, you know, among friends. I have to take a few lessons. I have to learn a little bit about how to read musical notation and that sort of thing. I have to learn something about it, and I have to do some practicing. If I want to be a concert pianist, if I want to be one of the best pianists in the world, that means I not only have to learn in depth about what I'm doing, but I have to practice, practice, practice every day really hard. And that's what the John Edwards do and the Joe McMonagles do and the people who are really superb at any psychic skill. It's just like any human talent. About 1% of us have these extraordinarily high degrees of skill, and those people can be phenomenal, but they still have to learn and they still have to practice every day. Right. Uh, well, I think we're about ready to take a take a commercial break here. You're listening this is good. This to is a good cliffhanger right here. Yeah, it is. Okay. You're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on W O O N twelve forty A M, O N Worldwide dot com. Also on in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley. We'll be right back with our great guest, Marine Caudle. Stay with us. Hi, this is Don Brunell inviting you to join me for ON Midday, weekdays from noon to 2, right here on ON 1240 Radio. 
We've got gold cuts, guests, and our daily super quiz. The Midday Show, right here on ON, local radio at its best. Well, how would you like to hold 22 million books, magazines, newspapers, games, apps, movies, television shows in the palm of your hand? Well, you can wow. with Kindle Fire. I was going to say that would probably kill you if you tried tried to do that. Yeah, kind of heavy, but not mm-hmm. with Kindle Fire. Kindle Fire HD, Kindle Fire Paper Paper White, as it's called, and the uh, Kindle itself, which you which and all of them you can get uh, all sorts of books on them, of course, including four of mine, uh, Faces at the Window, Footsteps in the Attic. Rhode Island, a genial history on an entirely different subject, and Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. And I always drag the poor guest into this. Maureen, is your book, uh, uh, is uh, Impossible Realities on Kindle? Yes, it is. Very good. So you can also get our guest book tonight. So check it out at Staples or Amazon.com. It's well worth it, and gift-giving time is coming near. So think of that as well as a terrific gift for anybody of all yeah, ages. I actually got one for Christmas last year, and I love it. Oh, great. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the endorsement. Your check is in the mail. All right, very good. <laughs> okay, let's return to the uh, normally scheduled programming here. And our guest, of course, Maureen Caudill, expert in neural systems and artificial intelligence and experiencer of paranormal events and explainer of paranormal events. And uh, we're having a great conversation here. Uh, I did want to have one little footnote to the military intelligence thing. There is a tendency among these programs to... Um, I suppose after they've gone on for a certain period, they fund, there are funding issues, political issues, and people in the program get kind of comfortable. So very often the program will stop and then start up doing exactly what they were doing with an entirely different name and a new budget and all this business. That, that, that just sort of is, is the way they kind of do things. But these things are ongoing, and Maureen is absolutely right. These things are... Uh, have not uh, remote viewing or whatever has not uh, come to an end by any means uh, at the, the hands of the Pentagon. So, well, I, I just had a quick question, really quick. Um, so, you you study stuff about neurology, correct? Uh, yeah, I'm not a neurologist. I did neural networks, which are computer systems that are designed to operate more like the human brain rather than like a normal computer. Oh, they model okay. the brain, and instead of programming them, you train them like you would train a puppy. Oh, okay. Um, and they're based on neurology, but I'm not a neurologist. Oh, all right. Yeah, I had a question about that, but that completely wipes out that question because I, I wasn't I wasn't sure if neural systems meant neurology. And that's how out of touch I am with my science. Oh, good point. Good point. All right. So, how does um, energy healing work, and is it temporary? Well, I, again, personal anecdote can can talk to you about temporary. Um, first of all, I don't think we have any idea how it, how it works. And most healers have their own unique way of doing it. There are some schools, such as Reiki, for example, uh, and other schools of energy healing that seem to be consistent and seem to work. Uh, One of the studies I talk about in the book is um, used Reiki healers and found that the effects were amazing, um, much better than fake non-Reiki healing, fake treatments that were not actually doing any Reiki. Um, but perhaps a, a, in terms of whether they're permanent or not, golly, three or four years ago, maybe, I don't know, maybe four, five years ago, I did something to my right knee, and I don't have any recollection of what I did, but it resulted in a knee that was progressively getting extremely painful. I could not straighten it properly. I could not bend it fully or straighten it. I couldn't put any weight on it. It was swollen up, you know, two or three times its size, and it was red and angry. I mean, you could hold your hand a few inches above it and feel the heat radiating off of it. And I was popping anti-inflammatories like crazy, and they were doing nothing, and I was just really bummed. So I called my friend Deb, who was in Toronto, about 700 miles away from me. And uh, the reason I called her, frankly, this doesn't make me sound too good, but I called her to whine. <laughs> oh, yeah, my, my knee hurts. Whine, whine. And she says, and, and I had completely forgotten about the fact that she actually does some healing on occasion. And, I, and she said, well, here, you want me to try working on it for you over the phone? And I said, sure. What, you know, can't hurt, might help. I was very skeptical at that time. I had never had any personal direct experience of healing. And I am still scientific and skeptical enough that until I experience something, 
I have a tendency to believe it's probably not true. So um, I said, sure, fine. And so she started working on my knee over the phone from Canada. And the conversation was about an hour. And by the time we hung up the phone, my knee had stopped hurting. I could bend it and flex it 100%. I could stand up and walk around with no discomfort. I could, the, the inflammation had gone. It was no longer red and angry. It had completely stopped. And this had been going on for like two, three weeks, you understand, getting worse by the day. All of a sudden, wham, the inflammation was gone. The, the pain was gone. It was able to bear my weight perfectly fine. It took about a week for the last of the swelling to, you know, gradually go away. But that knee was fixed. And it was fixed in the course of an hour. I never felt her do anything in particular to it Mm -hmm. we just was doing and since that time it's been probably four years i have never had a lick of trouble from that knee ever since wow i'd say that's a permanent cure yeah certainly seems to be one of the things that we um uh well i started out in the seminary as long-time listeners know and started paranormal studies there and one of the things uh I always looked for my mentors and I always looked for was is this legitimate uh, and and if it is then it will last uh whether it be lords or whether it be some you know a shaman somewhere who's doing the healing or maybe somebody on the phone and on Well, Ontario. I just had a quick I just had a quick question. So scientifically what actually happens when you get like an energy healing or do we know? We don't know. We I think there's know. a multiverse. There are uh, some researchers who are trying to figure it out, but it's really hard to get funding oh, yeah. for research studies in something that most scientists say can't happen. Well, you know what the sh- a shaman, two shamans told me once, and this is where, and I know, I know I'm always talking about the multiverse, but I think that does explain everything. What they do is they say they go into other worlds where that leg is okay, and they, I suppose, do what physicists would say collapse the wave function they bring the worlds together and they make it real in our conscious reality and that's how the leg gets healed because there are plenty that of worlds actually where actually sounds like a very coherent and reasonable explanation to me yeah and it's a 150,000 um, year old tradition with some of these people too so well, I, I i think I, that's I, I you know, mean, I we use that argue I yeah. would never argue that that's not the case because that sounds like a reasonable explanation to me. Well, that's it. And, and we, we use that in all our paranormal work, that whole approach, and th- the results we get are pretty astounding. So where do you think science and medicine went wrong? Um, I, I think we all fell in love with the concept of looking at the body as a mechanism. No, oh, yeah. And what we have is we see... The, the, first of all, we believe that all we are is a physical body and that there's nothing except physicality. There's nothing, if we can't measure it and, and put it on a scale or put a, a ruler on it or something, that it do, simply doesn't exist. Right. I mean, I was trained in physics, and that's what my advisor always told me. It do, it's not physics if you can't measure it. And the problem is we don't have any way at this moment, we don't have instruments that reliably measure these subtle energies and so forth. But the other thing that it was true when I was studying neural networks, now remember that neural networks is trying to build a computing system that is structured like the brain and operates like the brain. And the not very unspoken rationale for that is people are trying to build not just a brain but a mind. They honestly believe that if they could reconstruct the physical brain, that they would have a mind. And um, they may be right, but not for the reasons they think they're right. Yeah, um, and, uh, we follow you. Yeah. Mm. There's um, in in my previous book, Suddenly Psychic, which talks about this personal exploration where I went, you know, just had my whole world fall apart. Uh, I talk in specifically about brains and minds and computing systems that have minds. Um, I actually did a soul retrieval on a robot. Uh, what's and that exactly? <clears throat> a soul retrieval, um, uh, again, it's one of those skills that you are that you get to play with if, if you go to a particular uh, program at the Monroe Institute. Um, but it's basically someone who dies, particularly if they die suddenly, 
uh, and unexpectedly, like from violence or an explosion or an accident where they didn't, weren't expecting to die, not from a long illness, they sometimes get stuck and they don't know that they're dead. And there is some correlation that this may be an explanation for ghosts, for example. They, they literally cling to things that they don't know that they really are dead and they can't understand why nobody talks to them. And time doesn't pass for them, so they don't know it's been 150 years since they died or, or however long it's been. And so when you do a soul retrieval, you're taught to go into a particular altered state of consciousness where that kind of being hangs out. You know, that's where they're stuck. And the idea is you go and assist them into first recognizing that they're dead and second, assist them into moving on to wherever it is they're supposed to be in the afterlife. Okay. And, All right. Uh, and, you're dealing with a couple of... Uh, well, I'm sorry. No, go ahead and finish your thought. Well, it, it's just that when I did that type of soul retrieval, I did it on a robot that was the Beagle Lander that had been sent by the European Space Agency to Mars. And I don't know if you remember this, this was a failed mission. The, the, um, the, the ship, the rocket ship, you know, they, they, they got to Mars, it went into orbit, it, it uh, sent the lander down in its little water, a little capsule or whatever, and it was never heard from again. I remember that, yeah. Okay. And they called it the Beagle after, I think, Charles Darwin's Beagle. Right. You know, the ship. Um, and uh, I was, again, at a TMI program. I was intending to do something else entirely, as is usually the case. And I got pulled away and said, no, you have to go do this. And I did a soul retrieval on the little beagle, like the little rover thing, like we have opportunity and curiosity on Mars. Yeah, yeah. There's a little rover. I did a little soul retrieval on that little rover and retrieved it because it was, to, he couldn't understand why nobody was talking to it. It was in despair because it had a mission it was trying to do, and it couldn't understand it. Very simple kind of soul, but it shook me greatly because, as to my knowledge, nobody had ever done a soul retrieval on a robot. That's really interesting. Well, all, all ancient cultures pretty much believe that everything has a, well, they'll call it a spirit, but an essence mm -hmm. or a life force or... Mm -hmm. Something of that kind. But I believe you struck a nerve with my father. Uh, yes. Uh, you're talking to a couple of paranormal lawyers, so to speak. Uh, we question everything, and we never ask a question that we don't know the answer to. Okay? And um, one of the problem I don't know if it's a problem, and, and it's, I hate to say it because it sounds snobbish, but uh, with 42 years in this field, I usually find that I have more experience than most of the guests in the particular field of ghost research and that kind of thing, and plenty of other sure. fields I don't know anything about, and we really, and including yours, really. However, you, you've kind of gotten over into our field with with the notion of ghosts, okay? Right. Um, long, long ago, I began to question the idea that we can be ourselves without our bodies. It's interesting that we are talking about physicality, but there's 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 uh, over physicality, but there's also over spirit. I had to say spirituality because that implies a relationship with God right. or something. But uh, over spiritism or spiritualism or whatever whatever term it is, having been an editor, I still can't think of one. But you, you get the point. Non materiality. Right. Okay, perhaps over non materiality. Right. Uh, when we're constantly going, and we're voices crying in the wilderness. I mean, nobody else seems to believe this, but I'm always saying, are you? really you without your body and i don't think that's true and the, the multiverse idea you, your body doesn't die either you know there are all kinds of worlds where you are well, there's a balance between the two well there is a balance but you're it's not it's either still one it, big you yeah you know? so anyway so when you said a soul retrieval and described that i have heard of that before so i did kind of know the answer to the what at least what it is uh the robot thing is really unique but the idea that people don't know they're dead, but they don't know they're dead because they're not. I mean, somebody can come in and shoot me right now. I'm not going to die because I'm alive in billions of other worlds, and it's all me. And that's it's a tough concept. But that's what we found, and we find that ghosts, what people think are ghosts, are really people. And we've had their physical interactions, uh, 
even with non-humans. And so that's that's been a big part of our work. So I guess uh, you did kind of strike a nerve, and I'm sorry for getting off topic if no, I did. No, that's fine. But uh, I'm, I'm just, just a thought, a, just a thought. I, I don't do soul retrievals on a, on a very um, regular basis, primarily because I find them a little creepy. Um, yeah, yeah. Not, not scary, but the place where you have to go to find out where they are on the altered states of consciousness, the, mm-hmm. the consciousness level where they're hanging out, I find that a very creepy, Halloweeny kind of place to be. It's not a real pleasant. Well, um, this is this is the week for it, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just not a real pleasant place to go, and I generally, you know, have better things to do with my time. Well, um, it's too bad we're not talking about that or the vampires or something, because the wind is howling through a crack in the window here in case the generator goes on. We have it open a little bit. But, yeah. <laughs> so we have well, appropriate I, background know, sound. There, there are people I know who do this on a regular basis, and I say more power to you. Um, I just That's not going to be what I'm particularly going to spend my time on. Yeah. But, yeah, it, it's... Um, it's a. It's very difficult to conceptualize what is, what it is you're actually retrieving when you do a soul retrieval. So, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Okay. I just know that it works, yeah. and some of the evidence that's come back from some of okay. the people who've done yeah. soul retrievals is amazing. You okay. know, they've been able to identify people and no no specific information about them, not just generally who they were but specifics about how they lived their life and what happened to them and who their relatives are and what their family is and where they lived and all that kind of stuff yeah so clearly they're connecting at some level with these people yes apparently um i'm, I'm gonna ask ben's next question because he's on the phone fielding calls from concerned residents about the situation here sure. uh, is contemporary medicine any more open to energy healing than it used to be or are doctors uh, still considering it a threat um, I think it depends on the specialty, okay? Mm-hmm. It's my experience um, and my sense, I'm not an expert in medical science, but it's my sense that um, certain certain specialties are more open to it. I think um, cancer oncologists tend to have a more open approach to it, in part because there's so many cases they can't cure. Um, I think surgeons are potentially less open to it than others um, because surgeons, again, they treat a specific organ. They treat a specific location. They don't necessarily, they're not trained to treat the patient holistically. Right, right. So the the ones that are more open to it are those doctors who take a more holistic view of the whole person instead of just the specific organ or disease mechanism. Mm-hmm. Perhaps it's over-specialization that might be the problem. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. that certainly contributes to it. Yeah. Okay, well, we, uh, we survival of bodily death, we kind of talked about that in a way. That's kind of the big enchilada. But well, let's go, because we haven't got much time left, let's go uh, to your next question, Ben. All right, so on the subject of reincarnation, uh, you don't really seem to commit yourself in the book, so to speak, you you don't uh, you do talk about um, placing consciousness at the center of the argument. So, what's the deal with reincarnation? Um, okay, there is a the problem with reincarnation is really hard to do a double blind scientific study on it. However, the University of Virginia um, had a researcher there who, for many years, um, did what are called qualitative studies, which are still rigorous, um, but they're not uh, double-blind studies. You can't, because I don't know how you design a double-blind study for reincarnation. Um, And have literally thousands of cases of reincarnation um, that have been validated and checked. That is, these are young children, typically, um, who are, who, when they first begin to talk, report memories from a previous life. In most cases, around the time they hit um, eight or nine, sometimes as soon as five, sometimes as late as the rest of their lives, they start to forget the past life. But when they can remember it, they can be very specific. These are not general, oh, I must have been a movie star. 
these are very specific memories. They re- they recognize people. They know um, where they live. They know the family. They know characteristics. They know what the, the per- personal preferences were. They typically know the event that caused them to die. Um, uh, they were hit by a truck. They were shot by somebody, whatever. And they know these things even though those events took place in places where in their current life, they've never been, and no one in their family has ever been. Um, and you would think that this is true primarily in Asian cultures because um, Asian religion is not uh, anti-reincarnation as Western religions are, but it also happens in here in the U.S. And one of the one of the p- specific examples I talk about was about a, I think he was a New York City cop, uh, Catholic, not a religion that particularly embraces reincarnation as far as I'm aware. Uh, he's a New York City cop, and he, before he died, he predicted he was going to reincarnate as his daughter's child. And then four years later, the daughter, I think it was four years, the daughter had a child. And the child immediately began to talk about, as soon as it was old enough to talk, it began to talk about the specifics of what the mother was like when she was a child and he was her dad. So you know, for, for, I think I heard of that case, yeah. For, exa- and, for, exa- and for example, the uh, said, well, when, when I was your dad, I never made you... You know, eat your supper cold or whatever it was. <laughs> right. you know? Oh, I know where I heard. It. I heard. It. I read it in your book. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there you go. All right. I, I mean, it's it's an amazing thing, and it's Western culture. No, no people were Hindus or 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 Shinto or Confucianism or Taoist. These are people who were conventional, ordinary people, and they don't get talked about much in the U.S. Mm-hmm. They tend to get suppressed. The parents tend to punish children who claim past life memories, and therefore the child learns to not talk about it or to suppress the memories. Boy, then you're lucky you had me for a father. I know. Yeah, well, generally speaking, these memories usually, although not in all cases, will fade away by the time the kids may be in school age, something like that. Uh, certainly by puberty, they tend to pretty much have disappeared. But there are some instances where the person retains those memories for their entire life. Well, there are a couple of issues with with reincarnation. Well, reincarnation in Eastern cultures is typically viewed as a bad thing. Like, you don't want to be reincarnated. You want to escape from the cycle. Yeah. That's true in in Hinduism. It's not necessarily... So in all the Eastern cultures. Oh, no, well, not in Western culture either, because people you know, are very comfortable with the idea that their precious self isn't going to go poof, you know. Um, but but the, the, there are three, three points I just want to get your thoughts on. As ghost researchers, you know, having started out that way, I always uh, wondered why, if reincarnation is true, why are there so many old ghosts, so to speak? Okay. Um, the, the issue there is my one of my big issues with all of this stuff, and that is you're assuming time matters. Well, that's that's my second point, so go ahead. (laughs) When you get out of my experience uh, uh, of, of when you go into these altered states of consciousness is, first of all, there are a lot of different levels and different kinds of altered states of consciousness. But when you go to a deep enough level, you start operating outside of time. And this is one of the problems that physics has with paranormal phenomena because it does not obey the rules of time and space. It, the remote viewer can view the past and the future as easily as they can the present. <laughs> okay? They can view someplace around the world as easily as they can the room next door. So time and space stop becoming limitations. And time... To say that a ghost has been a ghost for 150 years, why are they still a ghost? Well, there is no time at the ghost level. The level that, that when, when you go up into a soul retrieval, the level that you're accessing them as souls that need to be retrieved is much beyond the level at which time exists. So okay, they're yeah. outside of time. 
So and you, for them, they think it's overnight. Yeah. Well, you've led right into the second point, which is time. And uh, right. talking about physics, and you have training in physics, I mean, it seems that time, well, even Einstein said time is essentially a function of our consciousness. So we determine, really, the rules of time and space. So, so I see just what you're saying with that. Uh, but the whole reincarnation thing, uh, at least to me, seems, um, in the classical sense, very strange because there really is no past to future. There's no past to have a life in. I mean, we tend to agree with the more, uh, I suppose, quantum concept that all things are occurring simultaneously and that you're living parallel lives rather than past lives, which right. I suppose is six of one, half a dozen of the other. But it made it a point to talk to regression therapists for many, many years on this, and they'll say, gee, funny you should say, ask, do I encounter subjects who describe worlds I don't recognize or lives that are in the future? And it does seem to be accepted, the, the notion of simultaneous lives does seem to be more accepted now in that particular community. Right. One thing I wanted to point out, too, and I don't know if you're aware of this study, and I, I should have brought the information with me, but I can't recall just who did it or when. It was about 20 years ago, but there was a study done in reincarnation with twins, mm -hmm. and it was found that twins, at least in this study, had, in, in like 85% of the cases, had the same reincarnation memories as their, their twin siblings. And the guy said, well, what's this about? And uh, he brought in genealogists, and they found out that the, the people they had memories from were ancestors of theirs. Mm -hmm. And I thought, my gosh, this whole idea of ancestral memory isn't really well defined, but I th what an interesting possibility. But then I asked, well, then you know, even if you have an ancestral memory, presumably it would, it would separate from the, the, the common mind, so to speak, when you're born, and you wouldn't have memories of the person's death. So, so th th what, what say you on all that? I mean, it just... It makes sense in a certain way and not in other ways. Well, okay. Uh, remember that you're applying our convention of what makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. To something yep. that it doesn't may not necessarily apply to. But number one, your your comment on simultaneous lives is absolutely dead on correct. Um, there uh, there are people who have multiple lives going on simultaneously. Um, Bob Monroe was one of those that he knew not only that he had a lifetime he was living in Virginia, but at the same time he knew he had another life going on um, in, uh, I think it was either Russia or Eastern Europe, I'm not sure exactly where, and it freaked him out so much that he never, ex he never wanted to come into contact with that person. He never wanted to look them up and find out what their life was like. So, yes, it is, it, to talk about reincarnation, your next reincarnated life might be in our physical past, okay? Yeah, well, well we would say your consciousness goes where you already are. Outside yeah. of time. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're alternate lives. They're parallel lives. They're not sequential. Interesting. Uh, well, I'm afraid, well, I'm afraid we're just about out of time here, Maureen, but what a fascinating conversation. I wanted to give you a chance to talk about uh, your book, your website, and your, your, uh, your other book as well, and uh, just uh, just go for it. Okay. Uh, the book is called uh, Impossible Realities, and I try to make sense of the scientific data that supports about eight different psychic phenomena. These are phenomena that I personally have had some experience with, and that's why I chose those particular ones to talk to. I, you know, I try to keep it small. Um, it plays off the previous book I did called Suddenly Psychic, A Skeptic's Journey. Uh, Suddenly Psychic is about my transition from a physical materialist type skeptic to someone who realizes that not only am I psychic, but so is everybody else, and so you you are too. And it talks about the specific events and experiences I had that caused me to become, that sort of freaked me out a little bit. Um, Impossible Reality talks about more of those events and then looks at the scientific evidence that supports that they occurred. My um, website, there's a website called scienceofpsychicphenomena.com, which talks about the specific evidence and it's it's directly related to impossible realities you can also get at it there's a link on my main website which is maureencaudill.com very good well again I'll, I'll repeat my endorsement you know speaking as a professional editor this is one of the most articulate books on this subject i've ever read and i really recommend it to everyone maureen great conversation thank you so much we'll be in touch again off the air i may have you have a talk with my son about ruining all our silverware sorry <laughs> okay. it gets them out of doing the dishes though huh yeah, he'll do anything to do that. Yep. <laughs> so will I, actually. Very good. Maureen Cardell, everyone, thank you very, very much.
Thank you. I enjoyed it. Great. Okay. All right. So we have a few announcements. My dad and I finished up our regular speaking se- season uh, with three presentations. Or actually, two, well, two presentations. Everybody was running the away because uh, of the storm. Yes. The other afternoon, yesterday, at the All Hallows Eve Psychic Fair at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Rhode Island. But we are always open for bookings over the winter. So www.behindtheparanormal.com to see more information. Okay. Yeah, there was a booking form as well. Okay, and stay tuned for news of Necronomicon Providence. The H.P. Lovecraft Convention set for August 23rd to 25th, 2013 in Providence. We'll be keeping you updated on that. Okay, uh, websites too. Don't forget BehindTheParanormal.com. You can get plenty of podcasts. and all, all They're all free. Plenty of information on guests, past, present, and future. And stuff about us too and what we're working on. And as a link to our normal site, or abnormal site, newenglandghosts.com. A lot of articles, and you can buy my books on both sites. Don't forget to do that. Subscribe to our newsletter, or even become a show reporter. Okay. Well, are you going to thank me or not? <laughs> well, yeah, okay. I, mean, <laughs> I was thinking twice after the silverware incident. <laughs> Many thanks to our producer, Ben, himself. And thank next you. week, November 5th, we'll welcome back Hollywood producer, paranormal researcher, and psychic Jack Rourke for a discussion on his experiences and what is commonly called demonic possession. I can't wait to compare notes with Jack on that subject. So don't forget our CBS radio edition on November 4th, and our guest will be consciousness researcher Brett Luter and the subject of hunting UFOs. So you, we don't have that much time left, so Dad, why don't you get to the quote? Okay, we leave you this evening with a thought from the Sufi Muslim mystic Rumi. Your task is not to seek love, but to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. So thanks for joining us in our great cosmic journey, and we will see you next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.